I'm joined now by Wayne Christian, chairman of the Texas Railroad Commission. Wayne, welcome to Power Hour. Honored to be with you, Alex. Appreciate your work and have for years. Oh, well, well, uh, thank you very much. So as I told you before the show, the listeners to Power Hour, now the viewers of Power Hour, now that we're on video, uh, have very different backgrounds. So some of them will know exactly who you are. Some of them will probably be happy with you. Some of them may not be happy uh, with you right now. But many of our viewers and listeners will have no idea who you are, and they've never heard of the Texas Railroad Commission. And what does the Texas Railroad Commission have to do with energy in general and oil in particular. So first, could you just tell us what is the Texas Railroad Commission? The Texas Railroad Commission and Forbes magazine brags, I think, best with a statement they put a couple years back. The Texas Railroad Commission is the most respected regulatory agency for oil and gas on planet Earth. Uh, we basically regulate every mineral in Texas from the time it's in the ground until it goes to the refinery. So we do, uh, Texas itself is 40% of the national production of oil in the United States and so and, and gas. So we are the largest producer in the United States and the Railroad Commission totally regulates that. Um, got it. And so, and yeah, this has been a long standing organization and having been a student of the history of oil, you know, the Texas Railroad Commission uh, factors in very prominently in the history of American oil, particularly, you know, what happens when you have these explosions of production and what do you do? And that, of course, relates to today's uh, situation. So just give us some background. What What is the decision that you were tasked with making recently? Well, of course, we, we're all aware of with the pandemic. And then, of course, the attack from Saudi Arabia and Russia, from OPEC, on the uh, shell play in the United States, which basically originated in Texas, uh, we were under attack from two different levels. And the bottom line is, of course, worldwide demand has decreased so significantly, people just aren't using oil and gas right now. And so what do we do about that? Uh, my big concern was, uh, of course, as the uh, regulator for oil and gas in the state of Texas, my concern was making sure that we lived through this downturn came out with as many people still able to work and be employed and producing as much as possible, not wasting the citizens of Texas natural resources. And so at first we were, we were challenged with, uh, there were a couple of companies and others joined with them that requested that we cap production, we uh, prorate it by 20%, just, just sh by, by rule, tell all the producers in Texas to shut down 20% of their production. And uh, we had... From that, I thought it was a significant enough problem. I called a special hearing by the Railroad Commission, and I think it was one of the first ever that we did video worldwide. We had 130 countries, had around 30,000 people that tuned in, lasted 10 and a half hours, 54 pre presenters of video and, and audio, and uh, so it was a long uh, quite exhausting. So was it on was it on both sides of the issue in terms of for capping and not so just just so people know the term pro rationing yeah. is sort of an ambiguous we don't know but but it's you know as you said it's 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 uh, capping. I'm just curious just to play devil's advocate and I'm I'm on your side on this one. But what's the case that people have made for capping it? Because a lot of people I really respect who have made the case for capping yeah. slash pro rationing. Well, their, their logic is if we decrease the amount of production, the price goes up, mm -hmm. uh, just like OPEC does. Now, the problem that I saw firsthand on this thing, um, I as a profession, I've been in the legislature about 15 years, and now as a railroad commissioner, a different, different, different seat, but I've looked back. My profession to fund my political life has been as an investment counselor, so I'm a, I'm a stockbroker to an extent. And I look there, and I see that back 50 years ago when we, we last did this uh, power that we were given at, at the Railroad Commission, we were about, uh, oh, about 20, 25 percent of world production from Texas alone in oil production. And at this day and time, we were about 6 percent. So I couldn't look at this thing just logically and say, OK, if we kept 20 percent in Texas, that's going to be less than 1 percent of the worldwide production. I don't think we by ourselves would be a significant influence on world demand. But the, the psychology of that many thought would do it. And each of the ones that presented to us said, if Texas does it, we can get other states to join us. Mm -hmm. So even the ones that came to us and the ones that were for this proration, uh, this capping of the 20 percent, said Texas shouldn't go it alone. So I, I valued and honored the testimony we heard on both sides of the issues that night. I immediately got on the phone with the uh, my friends at the Interstate Oil and Gas Compact Commission, of which you are a member, 
which is for 80 something years, the, the oldest regulatory agency for the 31 states in the United States that produce oil and gas. And I've got with several of those members, North Dakota, several of the states that are heavy producers. And they at that time were not willing to cap their production. And so I talked with the Minister of Energy in Canada and we visited on several subjects, but they had already started from the sands in uh, in their part of the world up there. They come the sands where they produce a lot of their heavy in the oil. oil sands. Yeah, the oil sands. And they they had already done uh, the capping. So I found nobody was ready to jump on back wagon. And so we in Texans were all alone. So I immediately then thought and I said, well, what do we need to do about this? Because we don't need to sit idly by and watch this go to par to pass. So I called my good friend at uh, some of the associations and uh, the all, Texas Oil and Gas Association, Texas Independent Royalty Producers, which ran everything from the Exxons, the BPs, down to the royalty owners associations across the state. And they all came together and I asked them to, instead of, instead of we as government imposing what we think how to fix it, how about the, the men and women who for decades built the largest, most successful industry on planet Earth? You come up with what you think might do to help these smaller producers. And so I'm glad that our Blue Ribbon Task Force uh, came together and presented about 48 different steps that they think we can do to protect on gas. And one thing I think very interesting, when you heard the price plummeted back about a month ago or less than a month ago on oil uh, worldwide, the big story was we had nowhere to store the oil mm -hmm. and that the uh, uh, Oklahoma was going to run out of space. We had about 50 million barrels we could store and then we capped out and that would be a destructive our task force came back last week and reported they had through pipeline associations through salt domes using them through uh, additional space a new uh business down in corpus christi they discovered about 70 to 80 billion barrels of space available just in texas so it's mm -hmm. amazing when you allow the free market to work and the industry to work and, and give them the challenge they came back with 48 times the ideas that we had on just capping production. Yeah, I think that's that's really instructive that it's very often thought when people are predicting different kinds of catastrophes, whether economic or environmental, they don't allow for human ingenuity. They just assume that the way things appear right now is the only way they can be done versus no, people will come up with new resourceful solutions if they really need to. Now, you wrote an article in the Houston Chronicle, uh, which I, I thought was really good. And, and one thing you talked about was you didn't believe that Texas should be central planning the energy industry. Could you talk about that? Well, of course, it was back to the stats. You know, we're sitting here with 1% of the world market. So it's not right for Texas to be telling the rest of the world if we had the power to, perhaps, even if you wanted to. Though I think really that uh, the government, people, it sounds real simple if we're in a problem whether it be the current uh, virus that we're, we're having in the United States, always it seems government then comes in and answers all the questions. Uh, my philosophy has been, and, and my almost two decades in government has been, government never has the best answer to a situation, rarely has the best answer. Sometimes maybe militarily, yes, but as far as efficiency, really creating a problem, then I, do, I don't turn to government. And that's why I think my position is to make sure that government watches over the safety of the, the product, the lack of waste of the products that we've been given, our natural resources. But then the best ingenuity is what should be my responsibility to, to allow to answer any problem. And that's why I've been consistently saying we in government should make sure that we're sitting alongside. We watch the bad actors in any situation and implement rulings, regulations, keep the public safe, the environmental safety, flaring other issues we can look at. But in this particular instance, it's getting people back to work. It's moms and dads out there that don't have jobs that concern me the most. Yeah, I think I really wish that more public officials had this kind of attitude that there, you know, there's a difference between a government problem, which is which is a problem where force is required. So something like you get attacked by a foreign country, private yeah. citizens can't rationally deal with that kind of thing. But if you're talking about well, an economic problem, that's something that free individuals need to resolve. Uh, on their own. And, and it's it's a huge problem when people think, oh, there's a problem in the society. The government needs to use force to dictate how it's going to be solved. Can you imagine that the government would have had any idea how to find the storage uh, capacity 
Or, you know, no, what if they, the government props up inefficient arrangements for years and years and years? Is that really going to help anyone long term? I mean, so I, I just think it's it's I just want to point out it's very unusual that officials are saying, yeah, the government has a specific role. But most problems that come up in life, it's up to free people to solve on their own. Well, I think like you have so wisely shown us a lot, Alex, and you really have set the standard. It's not really hard to find the truth. It's really pretty simple. There's right ways and wrong ways. And to simply look at history, the proof of what has happened, what has worked, it's not hard to turn in a decision and go back to that's what's worked. And in the United States, we have become the most successful superpower on planet Earth. And it never has been the fault or the credit of the government for doing that. It's because we unleashed uh, the independent entrepreneur, companies, corporations, uh, people to get out here and to make the American dream happen. Government doesn't do that. Government just should protect that. And when you turn the ingenuity of the citizens loose in Texas, I guarantee you we're going to kick you know what all over the world. And Texas will be back. The United States. The history is 100% of the time, America has always come back better off from any problem we've ever faced, whether it be a world war, whether it be 9-11, whatever the situation, we've come back better, stronger, richer both in America and in Texas. And I'll believe in that till the day I die. Yeah, I mean, I, I believe in that as long as the freedom is protected. I mean, like any, you know, no country is is uh, is exempt from what you might call natural law. Like if you restrict the freedom of individuals, you're going to restrict the creativity and success of individuals. There's no, uh, there's no getting around that. And related to freedom, in your article toward the end, you talked about you have this blue ribbon commission. And I think you suggested that you're looking for other types of policies that can be helpful to the industry. And what I'm particularly interested in is what are ways in which we can liberate the industry further from irrational government restrictions? Because if we can do that, then we can, we can help the industry by making it freer versus by controlling the industry. So do you have any ideas going forward in terms of policy changes that would free the market more rather than less? Well, frankly, the industry as a whole, United States, worldwide, uh, and, and this is being very braggadocious, but the fact is the Railroad Commission of Texas and the state of Texas have been pretty well an example of uh, turning loose those independent folks that want to uh, waste their to risk their money, risk their livelihood, go out and drill, rough, get out there and, and try to put their fortune in the ground and develop. The, the Railroad Commission of Texas and Texas historically has not regulated exploration, has not regulated people getting out there and, and trying to wildcat, trying to get them to discover things. Now, we immediately, the Railroad Commission st steps in. Once they discover it, then it's our place to regulate it, make sure it's safe, make sure it's it's uh, done correctly according to the laws and regulations that we've adopted through the years to protect the public and the natural resources. But we allow the exploration. We encourage people to come in. Drill, baby, drill is not an unknown statement in Texas. And that's a different attitude that many states have. Also, Texas has, by the way, is only one of two states that has their elected officials statewide, such as myself, that's elected to regulate oil and gas. Us in Oklahoma, the only two states. Every other state has a go the governor runs everything and the governor appoints the oil and gas regulator. Now, that may work if you have a good governor that loves oil and gas. But you take a state like, say, we, we share the largest discovery of oil in the history of the world. And a lot of people don't know this. Right now in, the, in West Texas, the Permian Basin, the projection is not up, up to the projection up to nine times the resources we had before about 2016 we have it there 230 billion barrels of oil have been discovered in west texas and new mexico owns a good chunk of that but new mexico's leader is the governor and their governor is uh very much restrictive on oil and gas and is uh more lenient toward the keep it in the ground folks so their their policies are very different from the state of texas where we independently are elected to control the oil and gas industry are not dependent directly on a governor who may not be friendly. So we've kept somewhat of an independence for our oil and gas industry to directly the population of the electorate. Yeah, I mean, what we're seeing in other states in New Mexico is a good example. I think Colorado is also a good example where you're just seeing increasingly the regulatory bodies are often viewed as we're trying to help people not use the uh, the resource. We're, we're trying to restrict it. And so the idea is that we're getting you uh, off of it versus no, we're, we're enforcing laws that help you do it uh, uh, safely. So I see, 
Uh, so just as we wrap up, I see a certain book on your shelf, the bright yeah. blue book that yes. I recognize. I wrote that book uh, some some years ago. How'd you how'd you learn about that book? Well, I, I first found it on Audible.com and listened to it. Okay, Audio. Oh, com. really? And it's great for people. I would encourage people to buy more case of fossil fuel. And if you're like me, do a lot of driving in the highway. It's a great, great audio book to get. But of course, uh, I found the book. It started telling me true stories about understanding the truth of oil and gas versus uh, the Green New Deal and the Green uh, Al Gore story. And they start, I started learning from you about these computer models that have been 100% wrong in all of history and uh, how we are seeing the same relevance, maybe even to the uh, pandemic we're experiencing right now. The models seem to keep rolling out wrong. And I've learned a lot, Alex, from you, from that book. And I started giving that book, in fact, I ordered a case of them from you, and uh, we started giving them to people that would visit us at the Railroad Commission so I could tell the industry. Quite challenging, what I found is the industry itself. There was an article about a month ago that said the 10 worst enemies to the oil and gas industry. Number one, the oil and gas industry. Uh, the oil and gas industry has set on their rear ends and have allowed the uh, the opponents to 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 express that oil and gas is something wrong, it's harmful to earth, that the industry is polluting, that oil and gas should go away. And people do not understand the truth. One, one neat fact from the EPA director of the United States right now, since 1970, every major uh, gas chemical as identified as dangerous by the EPA has been decreased by 70%, since 73% since 1970. That means we, the industry itself, through technology, and fossil fuel use has increased during that period. Yes, population has increased by sixty percent, and it is uh, astronomical. I have the figures of how much more uh, uh, industrial use we have, and population increase, and yet we've decreased that use that uh, poisonous gas by the EPA director themselves. But and you also see, even when the uh, Keep It in the Ground group was on on the political stage on CNN. The Democratic candidates, all of them for keeping in the ground, but they did admit that the United States was only 15 percent of world production and we weren't the problem. So the facts keep coming out conflicting. And you taught me how to look at those facts, because you taught me to look at science, look at facts, not look at hypotheses. And uh, and I appreciate you, Alex, for what you've taught me as the Railroad Commission chairman of the state of Texas. It's made a great difference in how I've done my position. And, and I think it's benefited the citizens of Texas. Uh, great. Well, I yeah, when I was read, learning about the Railroad Commission, when I was learning the history of oil, you know, 12 years ago, when I first studied it, I, I definitely didn't expect that the chairman of the commission would have the moral case for fossil fuel, that I, what I, not that that existed, but would have, you know, a book of my ideas uh, on the bookshelf. And just one thing I want to highlight, you mentioned in terms of the oil and gas industry and, and does it always act in its own interests in the interests of energy freedom. I just want to highlight that this year is such a crucial year because we have people trying to outlaw that industry through a Green New Deal, but also through national bans on fracking and opposition to infrastructure. And it's such a difficult thing for the industry, I think, because they're suffering in such an immediate way financially. But one thing I, I think is important to stress is the anti-fossil fuel movement is not taking a vacation uh, because of the virus. I mean, they, they, they are trying to use the virus in order to justify the Green New Deal. So I just advise everyone in the industry, like, this, you know, we really have to, those of us who believe in what you do, like we really have to folk double down on telling the truth. And one thing that I've been doing is I've been trying to help any candidates on a really a volunteer basis, helping candidates with their messaging. So if, you know, anyone is interested in that, they can always email me at alex at alexepstein.com if anyone is a candidate or on a campaign. And we can, if you're pro energy, pro freedom, we want to help you out because we realize it's it's a low resource time for a lot of people who would traditionally provide that. But we have a lot of information and the American public needs to know that. And it's such an important time. I was looking just, I just Googled the information on an interview I did with NBC a couple of weeks ago. And for all those people saying we need to use this as an opportunity to replace fossil fuel. And you've heard that, as you mentioned earlier. Mm -hmm. but when you look, there's about one million electric cars out there on the roads in the United States. There are 285 million diesel and gasoline cars. So, I mean, and, and by the way, the uh, electric cars get most of their fuel, 98% of it, from either fossil fuels or nuclear energy, 96%. Wind and solar only do about 6% of the total production of electricity in the United States. So if you shut down fossil fuels, you'll have blackouts in every major city and minor city 
just even for those that are not maybe friend, friendly to fossil fuels, it is impractical, it is heinously harmful for us to go down the road of just shutting down fossil fuel at this time. And as you mentioned, it's a danger that they're trying to promote from the national level. Yeah, so this is really important for people uh, to be, I think it's a little over over 6% now, but one of the points about solar and wind is they are dependent sources of electricity. So it's not a self-sufficient uh, source like a hydro plant or a nuclear plant. It's something that totally depends on fossil fuels or nuclear to back it up basically 100, uh, 100% of the time. So if we're talking about relying on unreliables, that's not something that can scale and it's not yep. something we want to bet our future on. Something you taught me is the capacity they keep advertising with these uh, mm. windmills and solar panels. And this morning I noticed in Texas where they're talking about replacing about uh, uh, 5,500 megawatts of, of solar energy and 83 megawatts, megawatts of natural gas. They say that wind and solar folks will produce 23,000 megawatts of new generating capacity. Mm -hmm. And as you and I are aware, capacity is about what one fourth you ever get of real actual production because the wind doesn't blow, the sun doesn't shine 24 hours a day, which is what capacity means. And just for people to learn the misnomenclature of how they present this in the media is quite frightening. Yeah, capacity. There, there are a bunch of watchwords you should look out for. And as soon as somebody says capacity, uh, what? Because capacity means it's used with solar and wind. It's meant to. It basically means momentary maximum. So the, yeah. the highest moment possible, that's the capacity. And that would be accurate if you could control the energy and put it that way most of the time, like a nuclear plant. A nuclear plant's capacity, its momentary maximum is very close to its normal use. But if it's an intermittent source that doesn't even work a huge percentage of the time, then often its actual capacity is zero. So I'm glad, I'm glad you picked that one up. There are a lot of uh, these kinds of energy fallacies. Well, uh, thanks so much, uh, Wayne. Any final messages you want to give to the audience? Well, I just think the history of oil and gas in the United States, and especially Texas, is valuable. And we need to understand the truth of the past. You go back to World War I, it was a field in Ranger, Texas, that produced what the Europeans called a wave of Texas oil that helped win World War I. World War II, Winston Churchill, after World War II, which is the greatest generation from which we developed the world's first superpower in the United States, the greatest generation. And in that, Winston Churchill said the war was won on a sea of East Texas oil from deep East Texas. And what folks need to realize now is we all of a sudden are, have been given for the third time the largest discovery of oil in the history of the world, potentially 230 billion barrels in West Texas. And I think it's a national defense, national concern, because if we take advantage of that and don't allow the false truth and false narrative you have taught us so well to, to be in control, we have a chance to keep our young men and women from ever having to go overseas to the Persian Gulf to defend our access to oil. And that is so important right now that people, I think, aren't understanding how important fighting this new Green Deal really is. Yeah, that's a whole a whole other discussion in terms of the foreign policy, which I, I want to talk about sometime on the show. So uh, thanks so much, Chairman Christian. Uh, thanks for coming on and, and thanks for making the free market decision. Thank you, sir. Power Hour. Life, liberty, and the pursuit of energy. Power Hour. The antidote to shallow thinking about energy issues.